Hello, dear friends. A very good morning, and may God bless you all. May the Holy Spirit, the guide, the guide of those who were chosen by God, the one who guided Jesus through his entire life and gave him victory, not victory in this world, but victory for all eternity. And this Spirit wants to guide you as well. May this Spirit guide you because He leads us not to conquer what is earthly, but to conquer what's eternal. How wonderful this is. Look at this. When Jesus said, the devil doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Can you imagine what it means to have life and to have it more abundantly as Jesus promises? It's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. He conducts us towards life, not a petty life as we see in this world, no, but a life that has eternity in it, eternal life, a life that is eternal, life with life, life with life, hallelujah. There are many people who unfortunately take this Bible verse and they apply it to conquer the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of hell. Would Jesus send us the Holy Spirit for us to conquer the things of the devil? Just think a bit. Would He give us the Holy Spirit for us to conquer the things of this world and be ostentating these things on social media? Is that really what it's for? No. He gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us for us to conquer not the kingdom of the world, but the kingdom of heaven. Can you understand this? The kingdom of heaven. Look at the greatness which leads us to the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing. Pay attention. God said to Abraham, Look, Abraham, I will bless you exceedingly. He didn't have to say exceedingly, but he did. And Abraham was a bit doubtful. Poor him. His wife was already old. She was barren. He was already old in age. But God said to him, Abraham, Excuse me, come here. And he took him out of his tent. I can imagine God bringing him out of his tent in order for him to contemplate. And he said to Abraham, look at the stars. Can you number them? Can you? Can you imagine the vision Abraham was having in that moment? The vision that you can have as well. You can observe, I don't know how the skies are where you are, if there's cloud or whatever. But when the sky is clean and starry, you can imagine, you've seen this already. So Abraham saw those stars 
and God said, so shall your descendants be. Look at what God promised. Descendants that would be countless, countless, innumerable, impossible to be numbered, those descendants. God was promising innumerable descendants to a man who already had a certain age, almost a hundred years old, whose wife was barren. And she was also advanced in age. She was already over the time of being able to bear children, and she was barren. So God was promising something infinite that he, Abraham, could see and look at the stars and see them. This is too strong. You can also see, you can also have Abraham's vision. Just look at the stars. God, do you think that God wants to give you an abundant life in this filthy world? Do you think? Think with me. He wants to give you the kingdom of heaven. That's what he wants you to have. That's why Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? These things that when we stop to think about, we rejoice. We rejoice. Why? Because the Holy Spirit clarifies this to us. He gives us the perception and the discernment to understand these things so that we won't be looking at the insignificant things of this world, which are passing. It all ends. It all ends. Anyway, that's not what I'd like to talk to you about today. I'd like to talk about, very soon we are going to be here in the Temple of Solomon at 9.30 a.m., and I have a message from God to you for you to resolve your problems, for you to resolve your life. Your life is the essence of your problems. This is for you to resolve your problems. Anyway, what I wanted to talk to you about is that I was thinking and meditating here earlier about the situation of the apostles of the Lord Jesus, the twelve apostles. All the twelve apostles, Jesus knew well, including Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. However, Jesus tolerated Judas's presence amongst the apostles. He knew that they all had flaws and their shortcomings. All the heroes of faith, every one of them had their own ways, their weaknesses. We all have our weaknesses. I as well, come on, when I hear this word of frailty and weaknesses, I look at myself and I see, come on, how will God use someone as insignificant, such a clay as I am? However, He, dear friends, He doesn't look at the clay, but he looks at what is inside of that vessel of clay. He sees the heart. He sees the heart. It's the heart of each one of us that he looks at. Judas was amongst the disciples all the other 11 apostles, he was named an apostle. However, Jesus tolerated him amongst his apostles during his three years and a half of ministry. Imagine how Jesus was tolerant and patient and long-suffering and good. However, 
it was Jesus, right? So you, you can even say, but Jesus was Jesus. Yes, but Jesus was guided by the Holy Spirit. I am who I am. I'm clay. However, I am being guided by the Holy Spirit. Despite of having my frailties and weaknesses, etc., etc., I usually define myself as the feces of the thieves' horse. I am nothing. However, what makes the difference in my life? Pay attention to what Jesus said to the religious people. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart, their essence is far from me. So amongst the apostles, Jesus would see that amongst the twelve only, and praise God, there was only one whose heart was distorted. The other eleven with their frailties and flaws and shortcomings, Jesus knew that they would get themselves sorted. They would repent and would be used by him, but not Judas. Judas was born with a serious, serious problem indeed, which is hypocrisy. Because Judas, what was his role there in that situation? What was he doing? He was the one looking after the offerings. And that's what I'd like you to think well. Think with me. He looked after the offerings, whatever was given and how it was being used. The offerings that were being given and the offerings that needed to be made available to buy food for the apostles. Because they lived only and exclusively from what was given. And Jesus wouldn't perform magic so that food would appear and bread and water. Nothing at all. People would bring offerings which Judas was appointed as the treasurer. Now pay close attention, please, dear friends. Very close attention. Judas was in charge for the offerings. He would see the amount of the offerings given. He would administrate the amount of offerings given. And he would decide what to do with it. What to buy. Whatever he had to do. And he was being deceived by his wicked heart. Deceived by his lust. Because when a person is a hypocrite, they pretend they are deceivers. They try to deceive others. However, the worst of all is that when a person is a hypocrite, the first one they deceive is themselves. That's the problem. Judas was deceiving firstly himself and then others. And Jesus knew that. Why? Because he would take care of the physical, material things. And the material, physical things were very enticing. And the devil does that. The world is like that. The devil offers. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. That's the reality. Which means that the devil offers the same thing to all of us. All of us. 
Judas fell in love with that amount of offerings and money and he allowed his heart to get attached to that money, to the offering. Which means that his eyes were no longer focused on Jesus. His eyes were now focused on money, which represents the world, which represents the advantages that this world gives, the glow of the world. It represents, let's say, the shopping centers, the cars, the houses, the yachts, and airplanes, and these, and that, and the odd. And when a person focuses, when a person fixates their eyes in the things of this world, it's because, unfortunately, their heart is attached to this world. And how can a person follow and serve Jesus if their heart is attached to the things of this world, attached to the things of this life? It's not possible. Jesus said, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself. So I must deny my flesh. I must deny my desires and lusts and personal dreams and personal projects in order for me to follow Jesus, in order for my eyes to be fixated on Him and only on Him. Did you understand, dear friends? That's why Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it? It's not that rich people are wicked, no, but because they trust their wealth with their life. They think, oh, I have money, so my entire life is safe, my future is guaranteed, but one day they will die and everything they have will be worth nothing. It's only worth something whilst their body is alive here in this world. But once they go down to the grave, none of their money and wealth has any value. Everyone knows this. So Jesus knew that Judas was like this. And Jesus was patient with him. Jesus was patient. Pay attention. Look at the term used here. Pay attention. Jesus, before being arrested, he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying. Then the following happened. Jesus said to the disciples, Look, pray with me, watch with me. But the disciples bore them. They were also sleeping. So Jesus, according to the text, Jesus talking to the disciples, told them not to sleep and said, Why do you sleep? Jesus asked the disciples. The eleven disciples, right? Because Judas was not there anymore in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why do you sleep? And then he says, Rise and and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, which means Judas was the leader of the multitude because he knew Jesus was there. Judas was the one guiding the multitude. And 
drew near to Jesus to what? To kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? This is very strong. Judas was so blind, so lost, so disoriented, that he sold himself to the priests to betray Jesus, to point where Jesus was at, so that the soldiers could arrest him. And in a different text, it says like this, Jesus said to him, friend, friend, Jesus called him friend because Jesus remained a friend of Judas until the last hour, until the last second. But Judas was his enemy, continued to be his enemy. But Jesus was his friend, meaning that he tolerated and tolerated until that moment when finally Judas with a kiss, with a kiss, are you betraying me? With a little kiss. And that's what happens a lot in this world. People kiss one another, but their heart is full of malice and evil and pretense. They kiss in order to try and please others. I'm not saying that everyone is like this, of course. However, the Judases out there are many. There are many more Judases in this world than the servants and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And why am I saying this? To draw your attention to the fact that even there, Hearing the word of God directly from the mouth of God himself, who is Jesus, still Judas didn't convert. He continued with his heart far from God until the end. And afterwards, he judged himself and hanged himself. Why? Because up until that moment, he was deceiving others, but firstly, he was deceiving himself. And now, at last, he ended that deceit when he condemned himself towards eternal perdition. Dear friends, what is the teaching that we get from here? The same thing that happened back then happens inside of the churches, in the denominations out there, in the universal church of the kingdom of God. There are always the Judases in our Mideast. There is always chaff in our Mideast. Because wherever there is wheat, there, there is a seed sown by the devil, which is the chaff. So what will you do with this information? Bishop, I thought that in the church, everyone had the same heart. They were all sincere because everyone sings and everyone prays and everyone gives their offerings. Everyone worships and so on. So I thought everybody... But unfortunately, that's what it is. And many get married to some people in church and they see they made a huge mistake. They married the chaff. You wore that pure wheat, but you married the chaff. And your life was destroyed because the chaff managed to tie you down, to hold you back. Therefore, dear friends, 
learn this lesson. Evaluate your heart. Consider your own heart. Do you know how to identify whether or not you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know how to do it? Do you know the solid way of knowing that you have the Holy Spirit? If you are well with God, if you are hot in your faith, it's peace. Peace. Whoever doesn't have the Holy Spirit doesn't have peace. Whoever has the Holy Spirit has peace. They have peace. Despite of the fact that they are clay, even though they are full of flaws, but the Holy Spirit gives them peace. He's there with them. Why? Because this person doesn't have their eyes on money or on the things of this world. This person has their eyes on on the kingdom of heaven, their faith, their project, their project, their dream is to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the goal of those who have the Holy Spirit. And they have this assurance, this conviction, this certainty that gives them peace. I mean, you have this certainty for all eternity that gives you peace for all eternity, starting here on earth. Isn't this nice? Are you following this? I don't know if you are understanding it, but I'm trying to make it easier for you to understand. But this is what happens. When we have the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee, God's guarantee, God's guarantee inside of us. And this, dear friends, is priceless. There's no money. There's nothing in this world. There's no glory. There's no family. There's nothing in this world that is more important in your life than you having the Holy Spirit. If you don't have Him and you want, you desire then you have to invest all of your life. You have to put all of your life on the altar. And please, pay attention. When we say place your life on the altar, is it doesn't mean, oh, I have to give my offerings, I have to give my treasure and put my... No, you have to place the hardest thing, which is not the physical or the material, but it's your heart, your dreams, your wills, your lusts. You have to place it all on the altar and allow, allow the Holy Spirit to reign inside of you and lead your life, your heart, that He will take over your heart because your heart cannot have true masters. It cannot have true lords. Either you are the Lord of your heart or the Holy Spirit is the Lord of your heart. If He is your Lord, if Jesus is your Lord, then your heart is led by Him. He guides you and you obey Him, which is what happens to me, happens to us who have the Holy Spirit. And once having the direction of the Holy Spirit, you are at peace. You are not anxious. You don't get restless. You don't get worried. You are not thinking of the future. Nothing. We know that sooner or later, we shall be promoted to the kingdom of heaven. Invest on this, dear friends. Don't you be paying attention to the amount, to what is physical, to money, to the advantages that you can have here in this world. Don't you deceive yourself, please. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. Because before a person is able to deceive others, they are deceiving themselves. That's the reality. That's the reality. Because that's how the deceiving spirits work. 
they first deceive themselves. They're being deceived. They don't know it. But later on, they will find out, as it happened to Judas, who found out in the end that he was deceiving himself all along. And he didn't find forgiveness. He didn't find repentance. And he condemned himself because up until that moment, Jesus was being his friend. He said, friend, friend, you are betraying me with a kiss. Well, pay attention. If your faith is cold, if one day you had a glorious experience with God and you received blessings in this world and you are very excited about that, but over the years you saw that that blessing didn't bring you peace. On the contrary, it only brought you bitterness. If you want to go back to your first love, now at 9.30 a.m., we shall be bringing close to the altar those who are in this situation, especially those who say, Bishop, I wanted to go back to my first love. I wanted to return. I wanted, I wanted. So if you want, then this is a chance you are having because this desire of yours is already the Holy Spirit touching you. He's the one there knocking on your door. When Jesus said, I'm at the door and I knock, that's what he does. He, he leads the person to desire it. Oh, I want. So if you want, then soon at 9.30 a.m., we are going to be here in the Temple of Solomon saying a prayer, especially not just the prayer, but giving advices and teaching you to return to your first love, okay? May God bless you and I'll see you soon. Praise God.